So, yeah, so we're going to look at, so basically, before we get going, so looking at, at planning um, for, for fishery management, looking at where, how we're going to make the maximum, uh, make the most from your work parties, a little bit on health and safety law. It's not the most fun of activities and, and fun of uh, interesting of topics for an evening, so we'll keep that very short and sweet. Then we're looking really into the, the nitty gritty of it, so the risk assessments, what to look for when you're on site. Um, some of the PPE, and then we'll finish with a little bit, some a little bit more around sort of clothing and 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 getting the most from your sort of fishery fishery management plans. So before we kick off, you've got to ask yourself this question before you really start and 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 just get your know, get your uh, your your volunteers working on site. Just have a think. Really, what do you want to achieve? You know, what's what's your aim of of the um, from the work party that you're, you know, you're you're undertaking or the task you're doing on that day? What do the volunteers know? Do the volunteers know what you're doing? Have we got a plan of where so if you've got drawings, etc.? Are you clear about what you want them to be um to be doing? And again, that really is restricted by how many volunteers do we have? Yeah, we all know uh, the best one in the world, people will volunteer to do something. Yeah, 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 I'll be there on Sunday, and then the weather changes, or there's a good game of football on, or the they get the, the they get to the seaside with the family instead, and you and you don't quite have the numbers that you um you think you're going to get. So you are really restricted by um, the amount of manpower you, you can get and again we all know with volunteers you really uh, you've got to be quite um, brutal in your thinking really how competent are people how fit keen uh, and sensible are they can you trust them to go off and uh, on their own and uh, and do jobs and will you will they uh, they work to the the standard that you're expecting again uh, do they have any skills you can use Lots of angling clubs and, and lots of fisheries have got a, a, a wide range of members in the, and lot, uh, some of them will have skills that you can put to good use. Uh, if you've got a, a member who turns up and he's got a brush cutter ticket or he's got a, a, he can drive a digger or he can use a chainsaw yeah, and, the, and they're competent and they're fully certificated to do that, they're absolutely worth their weight in gold. And so there's, va there's value in asking them what they can do yeah, and really trying to, to make the most of, most of those skills. Again, yeah, Planning ahead, have you got the right kit? Have you got enough materials for the day? You know, there's nothing worse than turning up on a, a, a job to, to do a to, to do a job and you turn up and you've got you know two spades and a hammer and the hammer's only uh, is bent. Yeah, you know, make sure you've got enough kit and materials and it's and it's fit and uh, for the for the job you're you're going to be doing. Have you done a risk assessment? Have you relayed that risk assessment to those volunteers who are helping you? And we'll come back and touch on risk assessment in a bit more detail in a second. Again, how long have you got? Yeah, is this going to be? Is it a one-off? Is it a job you want to get done in a day? Is it something you're going to come back to later on? If you're going to come back to it, can you securely? Um, can you secure that that site so people don't interfere with it? If it's a starting on one weekend and you can finish it another weekend, how can we? Um, we can secure that site. Can we get things done? And yeah, you know, the key to this is is keep your volunteers happy. Tea and biscuits really important. Uh, make sure that everybody's happy. Um, yeah. You know, Give them a give them a something hot at, at, at break, a cup of tea and a biscuit, or a yeah, you know, somebody fires a barbecue up and you have a, a sausage butty or a, or a burger at lunch. Yeah, it, it is important. Just keep yeah, you know, keeping spirits high and making people you know value what the you know or, or know that they're valued for what they're um, for what they're doing. And then yeah, you know, finally, who's in charge? Yeah, you know, make sure you've got somebody who's who's leading that task. Yeah, you know, if that's what they do for a day job and they, they do it in the, for a living, you know, they're working the ground workers or the contractors, they've got some experience. Yeah, you know, make sure there's somebody who's, who's actually driving and, and and overseeing what's going on at the um you know, on on the task on that day. And there's loads of ways of managing fisheries. Yeah, this is a fishery management plan. It's, it's to do with a commercial fishery in, in North Africa. There's there's a, a simple sort of schematic in the, in the bottom right there. I'm looking at it. <clears throat> planning, doing, reviewing, planning, doing, reviewing. Yeah, get to where, where do you think you, you want to get to? Where's your end goal? Where are you now? And what's those steps you're really going to go through to get to the, you know, get to that final finished um, sort of uh, fishery, how you want it to um yeah, uh, uh, to look. So again, this is a this is a living document. So re really, to so come back to it and revise it and review it, uh, do it with your committee or with your team or whatever it might be. But really, you know, we've all seen this acronym, haven't we? Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid, and short. We don't want lots and lots of multiple steps. It's going to take us yeah many years to get to. For you know, keep it simple for the for the work you you know, you've got planned and the work you're doing in that. Yeah, you know, and a lot of work patterns across the winter. Is it is it one season's worth of um, of work that you want to actually get done. Right, a little bit of legislation. 
just really to, to flag this to you, some of you on, uh, who are here will have a lot more experience of, of working uh, working in in uh, these sorts of areas of so health and safety at work legislation. I won't bore you with it um, too much, but really, criminal law uh, uh, aimed at protecting employees and others who might be affected by work activities. And this is enforced by both the health and safety executive and local authorities. But the real key here is generally uh, uh, HSA and local authorities have no power to investigate incidents uh, in relation to most purely voluntary activities. So if you're working on a purely voluntary basis and there's, a, the, there's an accident, it doesn't fall on the health and safety executive. What we do need to bear in mind is that the Health and Safety at Work Act does come into force if the organisation is, um, if it is a voluntary organisation and you've got an employee, then that health and safety legislation changes and it is enforceable. Even if you're working with 20 volunteers and there's a full time member of your staff watching over them, then the health and safety legislation does change. And also important to note on this. It doesn't include physical, it doesn't include damage. So if a volunteer um, drops a tree on a car, you, know, you are you could well be liable for that damage. You know? So the, the health and safety legislation, you've got to be, just be aware of this. And I'm sure you've all come across it um, within, you know, within your day jobs. What we need to def really define here is, is what is a volunteer? Um, and as with a lot of things, there is no legal definition. Um, we do have to, you know, we can dig around and we can look at, at sort of um, some guidance so that there's the NCVO, the National Centre for Voluntary Organisations, use this, this same description. And this is the one from the, the Home Office from their publication in 2001. An activity that involves spending time unpaid doing something that aims to benefit the environment or someone, be that an individual or a group, other than or in addition to close relatives. And the key really for us here is it's undertaken freely and by choice without consent for financial gain. So this is the important bit uh, for a lot of work parties and a lot of what angling clubs do. It's undertaken freely by choice and without consent for financial gain. And if we just look at that, really, yeah, so volunteers work has to be unpaid and without expectation of payment. Doesn't mean you can't reimburse people for out-of-pocket expenses. It must be out-of-pocket expenses only. You can't pay people for their time. So again, without free will and no coercion, and it's got a wider benefit, and you're doing it at the direction of behalf of the organisation. So you're you know, you're volunteering on behalf of the angling club or behalf of whoever it might be, and um, it's not legally binding. So you know, you, 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 there's no contract or anything entered into that. What we've got with angling clubs and uh, associations is there's a little bit of a grey area around work parties and work parties that are used as part of a payment scheme. So if you come to a work party, you'll get 20 quid off your, your, your season ticket or you'll get, you, uh, or you, if you've got um, a night ticket to fish these waters, you're expected, you, if you have a night ticket, you're expected to do X number of hours of work parties or you do two work parties or you're fined or you pay, or you can pay to get out of things. That then is deemed to, to be uh, either, it could be seen as either coercion or as a payment. So uh, this sort of idea of these sort of what referred to as privileged pay, so reduced memberships on our area and things like that, could, could also, could be seen by the uh, by the government as being entered into a uh, into a contract. And, and it's a really sticky sort of area to be in. Um, you know, it, it could be seen by the, by the authorities that you've entered into a, employee 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 relationship if, if there's a yeah if there are payments made so we do need to, to bear that in mind um, and i will just draw your attention to an excellent guide produced by the angling trust which on the back of a lot of what we've been doing with regards to to volunteers both in in this with regards to fishing management but also through the voluntary bailiff scheme and, uh, and other things so do please have a look at that and it does give some really yeah, useful information and it's it's a hyperlink at the bottom and i'm sure alex can can share those details with you as well so again yeah people should just want to do it they shouldn't be um forced or coerced into doing it for benefits they should just be wanting to turn up um uh, and volunteer and lend a hand to improve the fishery whatever it might be so moving away from that sort of that that sort of um, common law into the sort of more the, the civil law. 
they do we do have to have a duty of care so that duty of care is to um to each other and, and anybody else who might be affected by the activities of that work party. So it might be, you know, you're working on a fishery and there's a public footpath walks comes past it, or you've got dog walkers or there's people on horseback uses the same site or it's open to the public. So we do have to have a uh, think wider than just those of us who are doing that, um, doing that task on that day. So this duty of care. So if something does go wrong, yeah, there is a, a, a chance that individuals could sue you for damages uh, using civil law. But again, it, for a negligence claim to really to succeed, that injured person must show that the, the defendant had a duty to take reasonable care towards them and that the, the injury was suffered because of that lack of care. So if we can show we've got a duty of care, we've got adequate signage up, we're using machinery on site, we've, had, we've, we've, we've fenced it off, we've put signs on entrances, we've closed any, uh, or we, we've put alternate routes in for people to get around the, the fish or whatever the work it might be might be taken. We then, we're showing adequate duty, you know, we're, we're limiting the opportunities for the, for the general public of people not involved in activities to come into harm. So again, it comes back right to what I said at the beginning, thinking and planning and looking bigger picture stuff as to what might be um, uh, might happen on the day and being aware of all of, all of the, the potential uh, incidents. So think about uh, everything that might be happening and who might come into, into contact with that work on the day. And again, just the, the final piece here really is around um, okay. health and safety at work regs in 1999. And this is where you know we can start to look. Uh, it's an extension of the seventy four Act, and it started to look uh, towards sort of general duties um, and trying to protect and look at pe uh, protect people and uh, employed both in the Act and those public. And it's got a very loose term in there, and, and it's around the term of so far as reasonably practicable. So you've taken every possible step to minimise risks minimize the potential for, for harm and for damage by other people as far as is reasonably practicable to allow you to minimize risk but still undertake that job and it could be um yeah you know, it could be technically impossible to reduce the risk it could also be too timely or for for small organizations like a lot of angling clubs cost is um yeah is included in that reasonably practicable. So it could you could show that the cost of you minimizing that risk far outweighed the, the amount of, of funds you had available or the benefit of, of removing that risk. So it is uh, you, you can include um, yeah, both time and cost in there. And the key element of this of the work at, uh, health and safety at work regs is the requirement on employers to carry out a risk assessment. Again, we're talking about employers, employees. Remember what I said about a volunteer organisation? You know, there is no employer-employee um, relationship there. It's not contractual. But it did, for you to show duty of care, remember what we just talked about, carrying out a risk assessment and making people aware of those risks is yeah, showing duty of care. So I I would highly recommend if you yeah, you do complete risk assessments, which we're going to touch on um, next. So may, may be really maintaining uh, you yeah, know that duty of care. We carry a risk assessment. We relay those risks and and how we've reduced the hazards to those employed at the part uh, on the work party, uh, and we know then we've covered ourselves under yeah, the, that duty of care, and we've minimised the potential for for people who are, are working with us to come into harm. We do um, live in a slightly risk, risk averse um, environment these days. And again, I'm sure you've all come into contact with risk assessments, both at, at work or in any activities that you might take, any, uh, any sort of, you know, you turn up at, at sporting events or you turn up at any sort of voluntary uh, events. We do have this uh, this ability or this, this need to carry out a risk assessment. But it is, you know, if you look back some of the old days, you, you know, you look at... Um, uh, steeple jacks climbing fred dibner climbing chimneys without a harness on just on a ladder with a flat cap and his pipe in his mouth not really sure we want to be going back to those you know, those sorts of days but in the same same vein we don't want to go to a, a level like we, we can see on the right hand side where everything has got uh, a risk assigned to it and it limits and restricts us um from from do, doing our uh, uh our tasks effectively again 
I won't go through this in, in, in too much detail, as I'm sure you'll have come across them. And as I say, Alex will share all this information as well. But the health and safety executive have identified these five steps to completing a risk assessment. You've identified the hazard. Yeah, we've decided who might be harmed and how. So again, that's looking bigger, broader than just the work party. It's the general public. It's anybody who might come into contact with the site or with those activities on the day. And the risk that really is, is a guard to help you evaluate those risks. So what's the risk? What's the, the, the likelihood of that happening? How can we minimize it? Yeah, so we, we, we look at the risk, we give it, we normally give it a score on a risk register of one to five, or we, we, we red, amber, green, or whatever it might be. And then based on that, we look at with the precautions, how can we minimize and reduce that risk um, uh, uh, of happening and, and, and impacting people? And then we record them. Yeah? And that's the, you know, the bit of paper, or it's the document or whatever it might be. That's your risk assessment that's on. We record those and we implement them. Um, and then the bit of, that often gets forgotten about, particularly within volunteer groups and angling clubs, is to review them. We look at them and we review them on an annual basis or every time with the, the, the times we're going out to do that task. And it, it might be that you, you have to update them. You might have changed how you operate. You might have changed the... You know, the, the entrance to the fishery or the way you get in or you've removed the steps or whatever it might be. And that it, that tweak and amends the risks shown on your uh, on, on your risk assessment. And it doesn't have to be, you know, you'd have to do a, a new one for everything. You might be able to have a, a standardized template and you amend it and adapt it for different tasks or different uh, different waters that you've, you've got on there. Um, we do have, uh, whenever we do look at tasks, we do have actually have, three different types of risk assessments there's a general risk assessment yeah so that might be for the the uh the, the activity of volunteer activity on there would be general sort of things slip strips and falls weather inclement weather working on, on wet banks and all that sort of stuff goes in there then if you've got multiple fisheries or multiple waters that you're, you're working on then you'll want a site specific risk assessment for each wet party on those sites because every site is different and then the final one which isn't on here which is a, just a, what we call a dynamic risk assessment. So this is something where you get to the site on a day, you spend five minutes looking around and you just see if anything's changed and you relay that to those the, those people on the day rather than, you know, you go, oh, that's interesting. I must note that down, but you never, don't actually tell people. So, yeah, it, 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 once you've got them and you've got a template for them and you share them with your committee and people who are involved in these these, these jobs, it's easy to do. One thing I must say is, risk assessments aren't yours if you write them they aren't your property they are to be shared with everybody who's doing that task yeah, and i've been on some work parties with some organization where they actually physically hand round the paper copy and everybody signs to say they've seen it or you you get email or contact data and you share it or you put it in the in the clubhouse at the start of the morning and you ask people to read it make sure they're aware of it or you pull out those key points uh, and you articulate that to people and say today you know, the high risk areas are here here and here and we want to be conscious of that. You know? So again, really about relaying that message to, to people who were, who were there on the day. And this is just a, a standard diagram. This is what we call the hierarchy of controls. It starts at the top. The biggest bang for your buck really is you eliminate it. If you could physically remove the hazard, that's the, 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 top, the top line on any sort of risk assessment. If you take it away, it can't hurt people. But we could go for various stages and, and, and you know, if we can't remove it, we can't re restrict it, then we can look at protecting ourselves against it. And that's when we can look at things like PPE. Yeah, we can use hard hats, we can use steel toe cap boots, we can use high vis, we can use pr protective trousers for chainsaws, we can use eye protection. You know, there's a whole raft of things we can use to minimize the risk. And those those elements, those PPE elements, again, will appear on risk assessments and make sure, or, or task specific risk assessments. If you're sending people out, a gang out to build swims what do they need within the ppe to allow them to to make and build those swims safely and effectively you know same might apply if you've got people doing you know, bramble control or nettle streaming or whatever it might be there's a you know you might want to make just have a, a conscious effort to have a, a specific um sort of risk-based form and, and ppe for that there's loads of loads of examples of risk assessment forms. This is one we use at the Institute for our Electric Fishing Operations. As you can imagine, this is just one page of about six. You know, we're putting people in water and we're going to give them electrical um, um, electrical equipment and turn it on. Uh, it's not your everyday activity. Um, and, and what I've been doing over the years is that when we work with other organisations, I, I build my risk assessment based on their own 
and with our things and I add to it. So it's a very dynamic document, this. So, yeah, so it's now up to about five pages, I think, of the various elements we need to consider. But if anybody wants to see this, Alex has got a copy. You can share it. We can put it on on um, uh, on the, uh, the Angling Trust website or wherever you, you, know, you think. So that, and you can pull these out. The health and safety executives got got, um, got blank copies and, and, and templates you can use. Again, this isn't exhaustive at all. There's lots of things you might add to risk service, just a bullet list really here, you know, things to be considered. And again, you'll be aware of these on your own sites. So things like cattle, be that um, uh, 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 farm animals or horses, you know, inquisitive. Overhead cables, you know, you'll, again, you'll be aware of those on your site and where is, what your safe working distance is from there. Um, thinking about where, particularly in urban sites, is there any risk of sharps? We're talking about needles and syringes. Uh, broken bottles, uh, rusty cans, anything like that on site, we need to be considerate of. And you've got to think about people going in, uh, immersion. Hypothermia happens 26 times quicker in water. Once you go in, we all know about that shock, that we we, 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 we get that temperature shock, we take a big, big deep gulp of air or water, and then then we're in trouble. So really be, be, be aware of that. Um, and then it, really when you're looking at things like the emergency services, where's the access point? Um, you can give a national grid reference. Some people will put what three words on there as well. But if you're if you're doing that, just be really conscious of of um, you're nice and clear. If you can give a national grid reference and a post and a, a postcode, the, the emergency services much prefer that from what three words because you only have to get the words wrong or have a strong accent and the and the operator can't understand you and it doesn't work. Yeah, so as much detail as you can, and I'll, I'll show you in, in, in a second the sort of detail we can go into when we're looking at these. And again, just be conscious of things like mobile reception and, and access for emergency vehicles. Can they get on site? And can you actually ring for emergency services if, if you need to? We even, you know, if mobile phone technology has come on leaps and bounds, there are still mobile black spots in this country. So we do need to be aware of um, aware of that and make sure you've got different um all the mobile phones to roam if you've got volunteers who have got different um phone contracts on different providers then you've, you've got options there as well haven't you so i've just uh, gratuitously ripped this off the environment agency we do some work for the year through the institute and this is one of their site sheets um that they provided to us when we was uh, when we were delivering some training to them this is a, for a site on a river. This is just uh, at Brampton the, the Cambridge, or in Cambridge, sorry. And it really just goes into sort of minute details to, to where we are, how we get access, where the access roads are, where the emergency services can get to them. You've got the key elements from the, the risk register is on the left-hand side, and that's at the top sheet. We've got site access on there and who the contact details are, both for the angling club, for the work we're doing, the telephone number, contact details. And then on the right hand side, you've got a, a large scale map and the dot of where we're going to be. So you can show where it is in relation to the, the nearest town. Then you've got a, the junction and the access point there. And then you've actually got a site picture as well. So we know when we turn up, this is for a, a fish survey. We could see what the site looks like well in advance and we can plan uh, and start to make some plans accordingly. So, again, I'm not saying you go into this much detail, but it's a really nice thing from the environment agencies. It's quite useful to to have a look at and, and sort of mirror or or look yeah, again, you know, just steal elements from it. You know, just just get the best bits and, and put them to use for yourselves. Just a few pictures, really, from some of the, the work we've been doing. Um, those are a, a group of cows. If you can see those white houses on the, the top left, the access gate is there. The cows were up on the far tree land when we arrived on site. By the time we got our kit up behind the uh, the the single strand of barbed wire, which was the counted as a, counted as a fence. Yeah, the cows had come over to have a look. The one on the bottom left with the dog, we were actually doing a fish survey. This is up in Merseyside. Um, and we were just minding our own business, carrying on. And the first thing that came in was the stick. And the, the dog very quickly followed it. Um, luckily, we the stick missed everybody. And it sort of gave us a heads up that there might be a canine about to leap on top of us. Uh, and we was aware of it. Um, but as you can imagine, it was a bit of a shock. Um, and that is a public park. And, you know, we did have sign up, but yeah, the general public don't always read the signs. So what we should have done in that instance is a, a, a employed a, a separate person to be on the bank and really to be our eyes and ears. And we didn't. And we, we you know, we was um, nearly caught out. So again, lesson learned from that one. Uh, and the bottom right, I always show this picture when we do these sorts of things. This is just to show that the police will come out 
um, to to look at you, if you when when it's reported. Um, this is a, a some a fish survey we were doing a couple of years ago. Uh, we were reported um, as a gang of um, Eastern European fish um, thieves. Um, we were terrible fish thieves because this was in the middle of the afternoon on a Sunday in an open park um, next to a footpath um, with uh, a football pitch on the other the other side where a football match was actually going on. But, you know, to be fair to the um, to the police, they did come out and they did investigate and fair play to them. They were very interested and they checked our paperwork. So it does show, you know, the, the police do take an interest in the in these things when it's reported to them. So, yeah, fair play to the police. But, yeah, one police officer against a gang um, of fish thieves. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have stood liked his chances you know, if we had been a, a gang of fish thieves. Right, so moving on then, really, so to managing safety, this is one of my sort of, pet hates when you, you see on, on white parties, you know, you could buy a chainsaw from the middle aisle of Aldi. It doesn't make you a lumberjack. Yeah. So if anyone turns up with specialist kit, should be a chainsaw or a strimmer or anything like that, you know, make sure you ask for their certificate of competence. They should be trained. Yeah. Under the, uh, the pure, you see operators using chainsaws uh, for any task in agriculture, which includes fisheries work. Or any other industry must be competent, and this is under the pure regs. And the pure regs is the provision and use of work equipment regs in 1998. So there's an expectation that people who, who are using this equipment in, in um in an agricultural and outdoor setting has had some degree of training. Uh, um, so the, within that, you know, an expectation that they've been certificated. So there's the two certificate in awarding bodies, MPTC and City and Gills. Um and, and there's levels you can go to. And again, yeah, fair, brilliant people want to come and, and turn up and, and, and use their equipment and, and think they're being useful. But from a, a delivery and a health and safety and a duty of care point of view, be really careful if people are turning up with their kit. Make sure they're competent. Make sure you've asked to see the certificates. Make sure their kit, their saws, their strimmers, whatever their, their, their machinery they're using is safe and is, has been serviced accordingly and they're, they're, they're happy and confident in what they're you know, in using it. Get them to show you that they're competent. Just a couple of pictures I've taken, I just robbed them off social media. I'm in loads of groups and, and things for fisheries work. This is the sort of thing we we, we often see. Or we, we see we've got people working with chainsaws over water, um, you know, using a saw. Yes, they've got a pair of gloves on, but they've got no other PPE. That's not a safe and stable environment for that sort of, of, of job. And, and I would expect to see, you know, a greater level of um, sort of PPE and care being taken. And, and likewise here, you know, you, you've got somebody in a pair of jeans using a saw in his unstable environment, no gloves, no hat. Um, and, and I do like these, these comments. Uh, these were from somebody who registered to attend the event the last time I did it back in 2022. Um, they'd registered to send, yeah, don't think hanging by a branch for us with, uh, with a chainsaw will be on the agenda. And that's the sort of thing, you know, all right, tongue in cheek and, and all the rest of it. But, you know, it's that sort of thing that, you know, it, it only takes that chainsaw to bounce and, and somebody's you know, it, it going to be in real trouble. And I think they had, it's somewhere in the region of four to six um, injuries and fatalities by chainsaws uh, each year. Yeah. So again, yeah, these aren't, yeah, these are not toys. Yeah. Just because you buy them in Aldi doesn't make them, you know, toys. They are heavy, um, dangerous bits of kit. And we do need to, to be aware of that. Um, and if you are using them, yeah, there is a, a, a brilliant health and safety executive guide to using chainsaws. I suggest you pull it off, put it in your, your clubhouse and materials yeah, and make sure of, um, yeah, that they've followed before you, you allow people to, to operate. And again, there's lots of guidance on this. And if you are going to be felling trees, there's exclusion zones, there's, there's, there's exit routes, there's uh, conditions you need to be aware of. Um, you must have a suitable risk assessment for it. You must ensure that everybody is aware of it. You must ensure that these areas are securely fenced off and demarked so people don't come wandering in when you're uh, when you're operate when the, the chainsaw is being operated. If you're um, working at height, you need to make sure that people have got the correct um, certification for that. You know, there's lots of lots of, of sort of things to be aware of. And again, uh, please do do more some more investigations into it. Yeah. 
a lot of your members are going to be classed as hobbyists. Uh, they, they, they're not going to be a, a fully certificated chainsaw um, user. I've got a chainsaw ticket. I've not used a chainsaw in anger for a couple of years now. I would I, Before I was to go out again, I would need to be going on a refresher course. And this is recommended. People who use them um, on a regular basis, I think the refresher training is every five years. For those who are occasional users, they recommend you, you go on a refresher every two years. So again, something for you to maintain and to check on with your um, with, with your, your 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 volunteers when they, they come to to use your uh, use equipment like this, and also before you enter into these sorts of things and you have this idea you're going to start felling trees, make sure they haven't got any protection orders on them We're referred to as a, a TPO tree protection order. <clears throat> if you start dropping trees that are protected, then you, you're going to be in trouble with the local um, environment officer within the the, the council. And if you're, you're working on any designated sites, triple SIs, SPAs, SACs, whatever it might be, you'd need permission from Natural England before you even undertake that work. So make sure you're, you're covered both on the for the safety and also with regards to the regulations and, and, the, and the restrictions of what you might be able to do um, on that site. Now, just to, to, to look a little bit de more detail, that isn't me uh, on the left-hand side in, uh, at Bridlington. Uh, it's just to show, you know, we do get people turning up in the most inappropriate equipment. Uh, the, the chaps on the right hand side, uh, very much more, uh, uh, more uh, equipped or better equipped for, for the jobs that they might be undertaking. We do need to be conscious as well about the weather uh, and how quickly the weather can change in this country, where particularly this, this autumn and winter we've had so far. You know, they're getting these heavy cloud bursts, there's really heavy downpours, and it's you know, it, it can change from being nice and and and, and mild to, to soaking wet and thunderstorms and snow and that very, very quickly. So, again, just be uh, yeah, make sure people are aware and they've got the right equipment and don't let people go wandering off in tracky bottoms and, and white trainers for a day's work. And also, while this picture is up, I think it's important to point out that the equipment you provide to volunteers must be safe. Again, I bring you back to that duty of care. If a volunteer um, asks to use their own equipment, then fine, let them use their own equipment. Yeah, but again, making sure it's cap comp they're competent to use it and it's safe. If they're using their own equipment and they're happy to do so and they, they have an accident, then that's that's them. You know, that that the, the the duty of care has been passed back on to them. Um, but again, um. Don't be, if you're giving out equipment and, it, and it's and it's faulty, yeah, you do need to be to be aware of that. There, there, you could be again under common law and that duty of care, you could be liable. So make sure all equipment you use is maintained. You've got a maintenance log for it as well. And if people bring their own kit, let them use it. You know, again, but maintaining that that safe um, safe working practice. Hey, right, just a little bit about loan working. We all do it. I've done it. I'm sure a lot of you have as well. You know, you, you get, oh, I'll go and sort out X swim or I'll go and sort out, you know, the pallet swim and the pallet swim is 120 yards down the bank. It's, you can't see whoever, you can't see pallet swim because of the trees and the, the whatever is in the way and somebody's working on the, on the run. It does need to be very carefully managed. And just to, to say the, a lone, wear, a lone worker is defined by the Health and Safety Executive as those who work by themselves without close or direct supervision. So can you manage that as a group within your work party? Uh, can you manage somebody being uh, 100 yards up the bank on their own, fixing a swim that might hang over the water or they might be clearing brash and it's over the water? So limit that. If it's going to be risky, don't let them do it on their own. Input a buddy system so somebody's always working together. Again, make sure everybody's got a quite adequate PPE. If they must work on their own, make sure they've got line of sight to whoever's overseeing the activity. And you'll need a bespoke working, loan working out uh, risk assessment. And if you're not happy, just don't do it. Yeah, just at the start of the day, just say, no, sorry, folks, we're not working our own. Please work as a minimum of two uh, and always try and maintain line of sight to your, your colleagues whilst you're, whilst you're doing it. Um, and I like this picture. It's soft and, you know, it, we see this far too often, don't we, on work parties and, and other things. You know, even when you're in a team, you can still be alone working. You know, you're the one grafting, and everybody else is stood around having a cup of tea and a biscuit or smoking a fag or whatever they might be. And uh, even though there's eight of you on a job, there's often only one person doing the work. Yeah, and we see this yeah, sort of far too often. So yeah, try not to be the person with a spade in this uh, in this situation. Uh, and then really just a little bit more on on PPE. There's lots. Uh, uh, 
we we wear dry suits. We, we wear a dry suit, and and the guidance for us now when we're wearing dry suits is we still wear a life jacket. Um, so we'd wear a, a dry suit and a life jacket. You can see a couple of guys there working on a boat clearing weed. They've got a nice stable pontoon to work from, uh, but they're still wearing life jackets. They've got their PPE on. There's guidance around life jackets. There's different styles. Um, so please, if you're going to give people uh, life jackets, make sure you've got the right the adequate one. Um, I'd be really conscious of, of giving out things like buoyancy aids and life jackets. It gives people a full sense of security. Uh, if you're going to do that, the the, the, the mentally they think, oh, I've got a life jacket, and I can maybe go a little bit deeper. I can do attempt this. Don't yeah, just be. A, it, don't give buoyancy as life jackets unless it's absolutely uh, necessary. Restrict people to working from the bank as much as you can. Um, and if people are working in and around the water, have a throw line, have a life buoy to hand so you can uh, give it to people. Yeah, and, and there's a picture on there as well of a harness. Yeah, really, it's a last resort. If you're going to harness people to bankside trees to protect them and, 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 and give them a level of security, I'd be questioning whether or not I really want to do um that job so just be yeah just be aware of that and and first aid yeah carry a first aid kit carry a first aid kit that's adequate for the number of people you've got on your task as well and if you're not sure about first aid there is a british standard for them um and there is a limit and a, and, a, and there is some guidance on first aid kit size for the number of people you've got engaged on a on a job so again follow it up look at it you know you might have a little personal one that fits on your belt or you might have one in the back of your car but you should have one on site and, and be conscious of, of applying first aid to people. And then, yeah, finally, bring it all together. This really you know, comes right back to the beginning. What's the plan? Is everybody being aware of the, right, the risk assessment? Have we talked it through? Do we know who's yeah. using what and well? Is all the kit and safe? And I've got the equipment, people wearing adequate PPE. They know what they're doing. We know what, how long we've got. We know when we're having the important things, the tea biscuits and the bacon butties. And we've restricted that site to the general public it's secure we aren't going to have dog walkers coming on site we're not going to have people wandering in and seeing what's going on so that everything is yeah it, it is is safe and is good to go yeah and we're ready to to have that yeah have a productive day uh and a productive work party and we'll get a lot done and that's me i don't occasionally go fishing very rarely and occasionally catch things something um Again, very rarely. Um, if you want any more information, please do drop me a line. It's my email address on there. Um, I say we're at the Institute of Fisheries Management. We've got a website. We've got social, Facebook, and all the rest of it. So yeah, thanks for thanks for listening, and I'll uh, I'll hand back to Alex. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, yeah, really uh, concise and useful as always. So thank you. Um, there's, um, yeah, I noticed we had a couple of questions about sharing the um, uh, presentation slides afterwards, which I'm sure won't be a problem, will it? We can uh, stick all those around with all the all the links in and everything. So, uh, so people will uh, have them. So a um, few other questions which have already come in, which we will get around to very shortly. Um, but just before that, I'm going to uh, pull up Mark's slides, which we'll run through, which is all about um, the planning and delivery of facilities projects. Uh, and then we can obviously go into the Q&A. So if you do have any more questions, please do get those in um, throughout the course of Mark's presentation. So if I can just pull this up now. But if you want to just introduce yourself as well. <coughs> Yeah, evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Owen. I'm head of fisheries at the Angling Trust. Um, I will just address one question I noticed um, that came in, and that's about volunteer expenses. So it's, uh, volunteers should not be out of pocket for volunteering for the work they do. So it's quite right and proper for you to reimburse that volunteer for a can of fuel that's being used uh, for a work party. Uh, I would recommend that you keep receipts um, uh, though, uh, but yeah, the golden rule is volunteers should not be out of pocket. I'll switch my camera off once the slides are on. Um, so, why am I giving this talk? So, uh, my background um, is um, I've done a fairly recent degree in environmental management, which included industrial and environmental risk assessments as um, part of the modules. 
I've been a club secretary. I've been in your place. Um, I've been uh, running, involved in working working parties, uh, projects with contractors. Um, and yes, I was one of those people back in the day who would quite happily try uh, climb a tree with uh, chest waders on and a chainsaw um, and uh, do branch work similar to um, the photos that Paul showed. Um, I don't do that anymore. I'm also chairman of Trent Rivers Trust. And as such, we have extensive um, use of contractors uh, on the ground for really some quite big ticket items um, and some big kit that we contract in to do work. So I've seen it through um, um, in a number of different uh, scenarios. Um, I would say also that we have now an, a lot of guidance on our website uh, for this. Um, um, for this type of work. So we do have a health and safety handbook. We do have health and safety guidance notes. We do have a risk assessment template. We do have, as Paul said earlier, uh, Anglian Trust Volunteer Best Practice Guide for clubs. We also have a lot of information there on safeguarding. Um, and you can find that on the website under the clubs and fisheries resources. Uh, so I would ask you to, 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 to look at and, and go through it. Uh, a question was raised about Anglian Trust insurance um, and what we're doing today is delivering sort of best practice guidelines for you to follow. Um, an insurance company will never say you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, uh, they're looking for best practice, um, as Paul said at the beginning, and what I hope we're delivering uh, the Turbos is best practice. So I'm going to talk um, mainly around uh, contractors uh, and the use of contractors by clubs and the dreaded um, construction design and management regulations 2015. So any um, um, construction, um, any plan uh, design, uh, what have you that you have, whether it is building a bridge like that, uh, building a brick wall, um, uh, comes under CDM regs. So next slide, Alex. Projects, fishery projects come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes um, and with varying degrees of school and health and safety requirements. Uh, I think you know that. Um, as Paul said, it is always a really, really good idea to assess the skill basis of your members. It can be um, uh, very helpful um, if you find that members um, have the, the, the skills and the experience of health and safety requirements and draft them in uh, to help you. So as I said, all construction related work must be developed and carried out in accordance with the CDM regs 2015. And you've seen a range of projects on that slide from a big bridge building to <coughs> repairing a wall, CDM regs apply. Um, I will say later on about um, where the criteria for it to become more onerous than um, what we're seeing here. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, again, uh, very much what Paul was saying, uh, we need to plan. Um, we, When we're using contractors, we need to plan and to budget uh, or goes in hand in hand. What can we afford to do? Uh, what we'd like completed um, and to plan that. Producing a scope of work and design uh, is important. Um, it is about putting everything down in writing, um, sketches of what you want to do, the plans. For example, if you are um, constructing an otter fence, we have guidance on the website about the dimensions um, um, uh, that is uh, best practice and record it. I think one thing that Paul and I uh, will probably stress throughout this is there must be a paper trail you should keep a paper trail of what you're doing so that that can be referred back to in the case of any accident, whether that be risk assessments, whether it be the plans, where if you have a dispute with a contractor, for example, uh, it's important that's all written down and recorded. Uh, choosing a contractor, um, it's a bit of a no-brainer that this is important, um, but uh, if it's not one you've used before or that you know, uh, you need to check their competency, experience and qualifications. Can they provide evidence of similar pro uh, projects that you want to do um, so that you can check their competency? 
And again, managing the project, who in your committee or your club is going to be the manager? Who is going to be the point of contract? Those of you that applied for Angley Improvement Fund grants will see a section there on uh, describing who the project manager is and their experience. I'm a judge of the Angley Improvement Funds and we take that section very seriously. We want to be sure that that manager has the experience and knowledge and competency to manage that project. And care and maintenance. Um, um, the number of, uh, in particular, ot offences that we've seen in the past, it has improved, where clubs have not maintained um, um, at, at those fences, and as a result, otters have got in <clears throat> and caused predation problems. Um, it's huge. It's got better. Um, in that particular area, uh, there is a lot of guidance, again, on the website about how you should be regularly, and that is at least weekly, inspecting your fences to ensure that um, uh, there is no damage to them that will allow otters to get through. But care and maintenance is important for all projects. Apart from anything else, uh, if you're applying for a uh, to the Fisheries Improvement Programme for a um, uh, funding to, to do pegs. Um, what everyone would like to see is those pegs have a long life by being maintained properly, as opposed to two or three years down the line trying to apply for funding for another set of pegs. Uh, next slide. Um, as far as um, uh, getting a quote and the, and the costs for the work that you want to do, uh, obviously engage with a contractor to discuss it um, and what the costs are likely to be before they start submitting actual quotes um, to make sure that it is what, ex exactly what you want and the timescale for that project. Timescale is important. Uh, we're, walking, we're working around water here. Um, and as we've seen this year, we can go through drought uh, conditions in June, um, through to flood conditions in the autumn very, very quickly. So when you're planning your timescales, make sure you take that into account. There's no point in doing a construction project, for example, in the winter months, um, if it's going to be heavy rain uh, and you're not being able to get on the ground and actually uh, get kit on the ground and do the work. And access and availability of the site. Ensure that its access is available during the programme of works, uh, that any footpaths or roadways, whether private or public, can be routed around the construction area if you have to do that. Again, I'll use otter fencing as an example where we've had to, projects have had to be cancelled because clubs have suddenly found that a public footpath, um, um, which they thought could be rerouted or at least temporarily suspended whilst they did the work, Councils have said, no, I'm not doing that. And the projects have to be cancelled. And the construction site itself makes sure that a safety zone is created around the work site to restrict access. We really don't want, if we're using kit uh, on the ground, um, uh, the public to be able to wander in, <coughs> uh, question or take photographs or selfies of what we're doing with big kit and chainsaws. Um, so make sure that safety zone is, is in place uh, around the work site. Uh, next slide, please. Again, um, the client, as in the club, um, must be able to produce a clear scope of work uh, about what it is that you want to do so that a contractor has a clear understanding of the designs and technical requirements that you want. <laughs> um, uh, that can be in uh, in the form of sketches, um, um, paper paper uh, details, anything you like. But it's important that the contractor knows exactly what you want. And there's some examples there on the photographs of the sort of thing that we would expect uh, you be to be able to communicate to a contractor. Next slide. And what the contractors need from you. Um, a uh, clear idea of your uh, requirements, good communications um, in, as we've just discussed, uh, the scope of works and what it is that you actually want. They'll need site specific conditions. Um, uh, are there any where you want the, 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 the work to be done? Are there any hazards that you have identified? You need to identify those hazards, uh, whether it is uh, various services, gas, electricity, over overhead power lines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, payment schedule, um, again, in an ideal world, uh, you would be paying on delivery um, uh, once the project has been completed. 
Uh, there are circumstances when mobilisation payments may be required to fund materials up front. Um, I personally don't like to see those. Um, I would like to see a contractor that doesn't require the cash from you to get um, fund materials up front um, uh, or initial pur purchases. Um, I think you should be using a contractor that has sufficient liquid funds to be able to do that themselves. Um, but stage payments in a complex con um, uh, construction may be um, um, a reasonable request. I would say that prior to making any stage payments, that you have everything detailed about what you expect that contractor to have completed at that stage, and that you do an interim snagging meeting with that contractor to make sure you're absolutely certain that the work's been done to, to the standard that you require before you make a stage payment. Um, and again, um, uh, we would expect um, that um, at the completion uh, that the contractor will, in writing, inform you of what type of maintenance and care would be required to ensure that project uh, lives uh, as, as the project life that it's designed to have. Um, and then duty holders, you must inform the contractor of any other people involved with the works. Um, so the designers would normally be you perhaps, or uh, an expert in your committee who's done the actual design um, that you're asking the contractor to complete. Um, um, and any other works that may be happening at the time of construction or may be impacting on the construction or delay in the construction. Site visits, um, it's good practice to have a site visit with the contractor to show exactly where you want the work to happen um, <clears throat> uh, so they can provide a, a meaningful quotation. I have seen circumstances when a club secretary has provided the contractor with a map um, and said, this is where I want you to do the work. The contractor's gone down, misread the map, given a quote, and then got the job done in the wrong place. Um, let's not see that happening again. Next slide, please. Um, what the clients uh, should do, <clears throat> um, again, we're talking about the contract for designer. Um, um, the client has a responsibility to take reasonable steps to appoint contractors or designers that have suitable experience, skills and knowledge to carry out the work that uh, in a way that secures health and safety. So you have to be... Um, happy and have taken reasonable steps that that contractor can do what they do and what they promise. I'll come on to that a bit later. Um, uh, we talked about um, uh, CDM uh, regs um, uh, at the beginning and you've seen references um, in, in the slides as we go through. Uh, there is a level where um, a project falls within the notifiable criteria where you have to inform the, the HSE. A project is notifiable if it falls into the criteria that the project will last longer than 30 days and have 20 workers simultaneously at any point in the project, or if the project is to last more than 300, 500 person days. Um, I would suggest um, that it is unlikely uh, that you would have a project um, that would fall within the notifiable criteria. Uh, if anyone does have one uh, or has done one uh, on a fishery, I'd be interested to hear about it. Um, Pre-construction information, again, um, um, you have to provide that information to the contractor um, um, so that they can uh, assess hazards um, and put that into their RAMS uh, risk assessment method statements. Next slide, please. So, a contractor must provide a clear bid submission. Um, you want to make sure that when they put their quote in, it includes everything that you've that you've requested, and they must identify anything that is excluded, um, and they must confirm the time scale for the works. Uh, as I'll repeat that, um, as we're dealing with water here, um, uh, time scales can uh, fluctuate um, depending on the weather. Um, and then a construction phase plan. The contractor must provide a written plan explaining how health and safety will be managed throughout the project. That's their responsibility to provide to you. 
and evidence of their capability. Um, they must provide you with suitable evidence of their cap capability and competence um, and um, check it. Um, check that they've got um, uh, the skills and the license skills uh, that you require to do to um, uh, to carry out the project. Don't just take the contractor's word that, yeah, all my staff are competent, qualified, we can do the job. You need to check it. <clears throat> um, and if they are saying that they're members of the trade association um, uh, as part of that reference process, check with the trade association that they are still accredited uh, and that it's not a historic badge that they've got on their van um, that is out of date. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, competency, I've run through this um, uh, before, but make sure through their website, whatever, that they're competent. Um, insurance um, would suggest that um, um, the contractor you appoint should be fully insured and they should have £10 million employer's liability insurance, £10 million public liability insurance, £1 million professional indemnity insurance, and see their certificates. Uh, don't take their word for it that they've got it. Uh, and finally, just on, on cost, um, and again, through Angle Improvement Fund, when we're judging these, we look at this. Um, value is important. Uh, it's not always the cheapest. And we fully understand that when we're judging um, Angle Improvement Fund um, uh, grants. <clears throat> so uh, the cheapest quote is not always the best value quote to get the job done. Um, with the quality that you would like that to be done for your fishery. Um, next, next slide, please. Uh, that's just some of the um, accreditation um, trademarks. Uh, I think uh, I didn't check those before the presentation. I think a couple of those might be out of date, but that's the sort of thing. Next slide. Uh, so this is managing the works. <clears throat> um, the contractor must have in place a safe system of work described in their construction phase plan, which you will have seen as, again, you must be confident that the contractor is compliant with this plan and the plan is suitable once the works have commenced. Reporting dangerous conditions. Uh, everyone has a duty to report dangerous conditions on site, um, whether it be fishing club member, fishing club committee member, the contractor, um, and again, um, if um, the site is, is uh, liable for flooding, uh, keep a very close eye on the weather and also the EA um, um, flood warning system. Um, a managing site and construction hazards. Um, the contractor must develop suitable risk assessments um, to identify the hazards and their uh, construction methods. Ask for a copy of that, keep it on file. Um, and don't take his word for the fact that he's done risk assessments. You need a copy to be on your club files. Next page. Uh, this is just um, uh, what to expect if you haven't dealt with uh, contractors of a um, uh, before, but normally the, point, the initial point of contract to assess the works, give you a quote, would be a contracts manager. Um, uh, they should be competent to be able to um, uh, price the work um, um, give that quotation um, and then there would be a site manager or team leader or project supervisor who would be responsible for the actual work and the staff on site and then operational employees under that team leader or manager um, who's actually carrying out the work uh, and they should be uh, multi-skilled with previous experiences. Next slide. Snagging and handover. This is, um, from your point of view, probably the most important meetings that you have uh, because it's the finishing of the contract. So you should have a, a site visit. Once the contractor has said, I've finished, <clears throat> uh, then you should have a site with visit uh, to go through the actual works that have been done to make sure that they've met the requirements under the project scope uh, and the quote that they've given you that the work is of the quality and standard um, that you expect. It has been left in a clean state and there are not bags of building rubble lying around the place. <coughs> that it is, um, the site structure is safe 
and ready to be used. Um, and the contractor provided you with uh, built drawings and information about what they've done and completed. Next slide. Care and maintenance, we've touched on that before. Um, it is very important that you have a maintenance schedule, um, a regular inspection schedule for whatever it is that's been completed. Um, and uh, you, you, the uh, contractor has provided you with details of um, how best to repair if things have gone wrong. So an example there you've got of um, wiring that's broke um, and a, a repair being done. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is about the design in construction design and management uh, regulations. Um, so uh, the design, the one that you come up with, um, uh, should the design should be done by a competent person um, and an experienced uh, person to come up with that design for the work that you want done. Now that may be um, not a skill set within your club. Um, so it may be that you have to um, uh, appoint a suitable uh, uh, consultant to come up with the design of what it is that you want done. And health and safety file, uh, we, uh, I've said, I think, repeatedly through the presentation about paper records that you need to um, retain copies of the risk assessments that the contractors have done, um, retain copies of um, all that information and hold that um, um, in the club, in the health and safety file for the club. Next, next slide, please. <laughs> So uh, there are environmental uh, planning uh, consent uh, issues that can uh, occur um, that you would have to take into account. Um, and this mainly cons concerns European protected species and habitats. <clears throat> and whilst we've left the EU, um, and those um, protections are still in place. Um, and one thing that, that people don't fully realise is that the EU Habitats and Birds Directive actually in, underpins international commitments and that we are aligned to under the Berne Convention. So um, don't expect that to change anytime soon. Um, so uh, badgers, reptiles, water vole, water, white claw crayfish, um, great crested newts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, it may be. Um, that your local, certainly what I've done in the past on, on my fisheries, I've consulted with local EA <clears throat> and biodiversity teams and asked them whether they consider whether any of those species um, would be um, at the fishery that might be impacted. All wild birds must be considered um, and there should be no work done during the uh, breeding season uh, for wild birds <clears throat> that could um, disturb them. Uh, TPOs, uh, Paul's already um, talked about, um, uh, and again, you can find guidance from the council on that. Um, you may have to employ an ecological consultant um, uh, to look at some of these areas if it is flagged that you may have, for example, uh, great crested newts present or whatever. Although these days, testing for great crested newts is fairly easy, it can be done by eDNA. <clears throat> Um, and then there are um, um, air protected areas, triple SIs. Um, I would imagine you would know uh, if your fishery is within a triple SI uh, or an SAC, uh, Special Area Conservation. Um, and then check um, uh, with planning permission with councils. I've already given the example of um, a, a footpath that the club thought that they could temporarily close whilst work was being done. The council turned that down. Um, so it's always worth checking uh, with, with councils if you're doing things like um, fencing, uh, storerooms, uh, fishing huts, etc., to make sure that you're not um, infringing on planning uh, regulations. Next slide. Uh, and this is next couple of slides is just some um, ideas that you may well wish to take into account on construction materials and various other things. So, you know, recycled plastics good when it's near water. Uh, Anti-slip grip boards, uh, again, that's helpful when you've got pontoons or pegs over water uh, as an anti-slip measure. Uh, and then again, hybrid construction um, uh, can be a more aesthetic approach uh, when you combine the two. Uh, next slide. 
Um, and on-site toilets, we always, when we're doing surveys around um, new people wanting to come into fishing, what is their, what is their, what would they like to see at a fishery? Um, and um, number one, normally comes up is on-site toilets. So this is just an example here of a composting toilet that you might like to consider at your fishery to be more inclusive, perhaps, um, of the people that would come and fish your waters. Next slide. Um, and again, <clears throat> um, um, aggregates, uh, make sure that you're using British standard material, transport of uh, invasive non-native species. This is quite a big one um, with contractors in particular, if they've been working on one site that, for example, has Japanese nutweed <clears throat> uh, or um, uh, one of the other weeds, uh, you don't really want them moving their vehicles from that site onto your fishery if you haven't got them. Um, we do have, uh, on, again, on the website, invasive species risk assessments, um, and that does include um, good practice for vehicles coming on site uh, that may have been at sites that they could carry invasive species. Um, uh, I'll leave you to look at that on, on, on the website, um, but you really don't want brand new pegs or whatever being built by contractors who have then brought in Japanese knotweed um, um, uh, onto site uh, when you haven't had it before. Um, and then installation, uh, again, this is about foot baths. This is making sure that um, they drain away uh, through the camber uh, and suitable top dressings. Next slide, please. Uh, and again, um, um, we've talked about um, aftercare and maintenance um, quite a bit. Um, next slide. Uh, and that's it.